Hello and welcome to Let Me Bore Your Pain Away. My name's Jason Newland. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And please also only listen when you know the cause of your chronic pain. So this is for people for chronic pain. Um, yeah, so no, find the cause first before listening. Um, this is also for anyone that just wants to be bored. You know, if you want to, you can listen to this to bore yourself to sleep. It's, and also there's something worth, this is worth uh, kind of knowing. This, I don't, this isn't so much my discovery, but just something that I've realized over the years. A technique or something that helps with reducing the physical sensations of chronic pain. Also, reduce the physical sensations of stress. Same results in the sense of uh, the same recording can help both things. Now, part of that reason, and when I say physical uh, feelings, because let's let's be honest, it's not just about the physical feelings; it's our interpretation of how we feel, and then you got all that other uh, emotional stuff connected to it as well. I said all that other emotional, like it's not that dirty emotional stuff. No, I don't mean it like that. So I've got a podcast called, uh, uh, what is it? Stress and Pain Relief or something like that. Um, I don't even know the names of my own podcasts. That's unprofessional, isn't it? But it's okay because I am unprofessional. Uh, this isn't about being professional. This, this is about being loose. This is about being relaxed. This is about just, I guess, experimenting, opening your mind up to new ideas that may be useful. Now, I realised that was quite a high-pitched uh, word there. Maybe useful. And I don't normally talk like that. Um, can you imagine listening to, Now, relax your legs. That that would be too much, wouldn't it? That, imagine listening to a whole recording like that. No, I can't. I mean, you get me, uh, you get my voice, which is... Possibly the most boring voice in the world. Um, but I tell you something, my voice is only about 5% as boring as me, as myself. I'm way more boring than my voice is. I am very, very boring person. But part of that being boring is I can talk for long periods of time. About both subjects that I know nothing about, but more about stuff that I do know about. But I can also talk about things I don't know anything about. I can talk for hours. Um, I don't know why that part of my brain, um, I don't think a lot of my brain, I don't think works <laughs> very well. Um, but the part for speech is possibly overactive or it just very open. And the thing is, I, I live alone and I don't spend that much time talking to other people. I don't really see many other people. So it's not like I'm talking all day long. But I have had jobs when I've done that. I've worked in call centres when literally that's all I did 
all day long was talk. Occasionally I'd listen. <laughs> Very occasionally. So, this might be a boring recording. And everybody's got... See, I do post this on the Let Me Bore You To Sleep podcast. As well as some of the others. Because it's a relaxing podcast. It's a relaxing recording. And even though I talk about chronic pain and, you know, a lot of people, huge amounts of people have got something going on in that, you know, in that direction. And it's one of the most under, I don't know what the correct terminology, but the most underhelped condition almost that there is it, you know the, the you get drugs chucked at it from the doctors and there is treatment but not everybody gets access to the treatment and maybe not everyone can afford the treatment I mean I always I don't live in America but I, I got a friend who had he had leukemia Okay, he's dead now actually, but he, he was a, he was a hypnotist online on YouTube. And I had a little bit of contact with him, you know, I used to sort of contact him every now and then, see how he was getting on and he, he couldn't afford sometimes his medication. For leukemia, he couldn't afford to pay so he didn't get the medication. I was just like, what? How is that even possible? How can there be, how can you, because I, I, I hope that that wouldn't happen here because we don't, we have a, like a free, um, national health service. Now I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not condemning or, you know, having a go at other people's countries and stuff, because we're all different. There's stuff in America that's way better than here. And, you know, so there's, every country's got its unique, uh, what I'm trying to say is, most of my audience in America, so please, <laughs> keep loving me, love me more, love me, keep listening. But I was really shocked at that. I was very surprised that um for such a serious medical condition, he'd have to pay. I mean, just it doesn't make sense to me. It's very strange. I mean, we uh, prescriptions do cost money. So I'm not saying that um everything's free. It used to be free. Prescriptions used to be free, I think, uh, in the past. But now they're, I don't know, eight, nine, ten pound or whatever. But the actual NHS, the National Health Service, is, is free at entry. So you go into a hospital, you don't pay anything. But I think if you're from other countries, you might have to pay, you might get a bill if you're, um, on holiday or something like that. But that's standard anywhere in the world, isn't it? That's just normal. Uh, Thailand, they charge. If you get, end up in hospital, you end up, they, they, they really, <laughs> they get as much money as they can from you. Which is, uh, again, I suppose it makes sense for them. So, I guess I kind of feel the need to explain what this podcast is, even though I've done, well, I've done four of them now, five of them, three of them, four, five, I don't know. There will come a time when I don't, I just, I just assume that those listening know what it is that I'm doing, what it is that I am Presenting to you. Maybe I don't know myself. Maybe there's a little bit. I know my intention. 
And the intention is this, and uh, I will say this, you probably hear me say this sentence quite a bit. Listen to the recording. Try and have an open mind um, towards it. Because, to be fair, I, I'm not going to sound like any professional therapist that you'll ever, ever have heard before. And I'm not a professional therapist. I do have a degree in counselling. And I got a diploma in person-centred counselling. So I do have qualifications as a therapist, but I'm not a practising therapist anymore. And this isn't, uh, this is not professional service. This is just a podcast you're listening to. It's just a voice. A voice, voice, a boring, boring voice. Now my belief, my attitude towards this is very simple. If, whilst you're listening, okay, when you listen to the recording, if you feel better than you did before you started listening, you know, during and at the end, you know, if you feel better, if you feel more relaxed, uh, you feel less physical discomfort whilst listening. And if you feel less physical discomfort, more relaxed mentally and physically, and less physical discomfort, and less anxiety, all that stuff, after listening to me, then my job is done. Okay, that that is the, it's really as simple as that. That's the tester. That's the, if it helps, then use this. If it don't, then don't. That, that's how I see it. Now, I'm not going to be for everyone, obviously. Not everyone who listens to me is going to think, wow. <laughs> Sexy man, and that, you know, some people are like, what the, what is he going on about? Other people might also think that, but then notice whether it's focusing on me as opposed to focusing on yourself, focusing on my voice as opposed to focusing on your internal suffering, you know, whatever it might be, focusing on how boring I am or how unprofessional I am instead of focusing on your own discomfort can have an effect, a positive effect on how you feel. So, you know, someone might feel, I, I like these examples, quite extreme examples, <laughs> but I like them because they're, they, I don't know, tickle me a little bit. So let's say you're sitting in your living room, feeling sorry for yourself. And I feel sorry. When I say that, that's not a judgment. We all feel sorry for ourselves. I had a friend said, oh, I never feel sorry for myself. I, I was struggled not to laugh at that because I know that's not the case. Now I love, sometimes I love feeling sorry for myself. I have to try not to do it because it's, you know, it's not healthy, but I don't think it's the most unhealthy thing in the world. Sometimes perhaps we need to do that. We need to have a little time when we just like, Oh, poor me. And, Maybe those that don't have anybody to show kindness, you know, if you have, if you're not with someone or haven't got anyone that's actually going to show uh, compassion to you, uh, uh, it's going to look after you. Maybe 
If you don't have that, I don't have that. Uh, and a lot of people don't have that. So maybe sometimes we have to do that for ourselves. But because we're feeling, uh, I, I mean, I, because we're feeling the, the discomfort, uh, it's hard to step back and just be compassionate towards ourselves. It's not impossible and it's definitely worth thinking about during this recording, being compassionate towards ourselves, being our own helper, being our own supporter internally. So for someone that is not getting that, they're not getting someone else showing compassion and kindness and love towards ourselves. Maybe we have to do it ourselves, but sometimes it's not easy because we're maybe not used to that and it comes out as self-pity, feeling sorry for ourselves. And why wouldn't you feel sorry? I feel sorry for people. If I see someone, um, like my, my, you know, if I see someone that's not very well, I feel sorry for them. Not in a like looking down way. Cause someone think that I oh, don't feel sorry for them is that's, that's a almost derogatory or, uh, an insult to someone by feeling sorry for them. No, it's natural human reaction to somebody else suffering is to have, is part of the compassion. You might not say to them, oh, I feel sorry for you. Because it can be almost seen as a put down. But I don't think it is. It's just natural to, you know, like, well, also to think, well, I'm glad I'm not in that situation. And to imagine if you were in that situation, how it would feel, because then you start to feel sorry for yourself. Like on a mild version, you know, it's a, it's a imagination, isn't it? But if you was in that situation, like, oh, I'd feel sorry for myself. And then you start feeling sorry for them because it's kind of how emotions work, isn't it? Sometimes. I love the word sometimes. It gets me out of a hole. I say sometimes rather than I'm never definite about anything. It's easier. Gets me out of arguments. I have a drink of water. Mmm. You know, it's probably the only healthy thing I've ever done. And kept up my whole life. Drinking water. I've always liked water. See, I told you I was boring. That was a, that was a boring sentence, wasn't it? Let's be honest. I mean... This whole recording maybe is be boring, but that was the most boring part. I can't believe it. He just randomly just started talking about how he's been drinking water for a long time and how he likes drinking water. Why is he telling us that? Why? <laughs> Water's good. Especially for constipation, but let's, I don't want to talk about that. Um, don't want to get stuck on that subject. Excuse the pun, stuck. <sighs> the idea of having some compassion towards yourself might seem weird. But then, on the other side, It's kind of the least weird thing in the world. When you think about it in a sense of being kind to yourself. Caring about yourself. Isn't that the most natural thing in the world? To 
to care about yourself. There's a bit of background sound. But don't worry about that. It doesn't matter. Other people are in the world as well. <laughs> this is what, four billion people. I can't expect it to be quiet all the time. Besides, it's daytime now. I I used to be up all night for years, literally. For years and years and years. I'd sleep during the day and I'd be up all night. Go to bed sometimes four in the morning, sometimes seven in the morning. And I'd make recordings at night. It was quiet, pretty much. Now, I'm in bed by ten in the evening, usually. I'm up at about four. Sometimes a bit later, sometimes six. But I don't want to be... I just, I can't be up at night. If I get up really early, I'm too tired and I want to go back to bed. It's reversed, completely reversed. And it just means that when I make recordings, there's more chance there's going to be sound in the background. People in the garden, traffic... Uh, the birds in the trees, although I love the sound of the birds. And if you don't like the sounds of the birds, that's your problem. <laughs> I can't help it. I love them. Not like really loud, you know. Uh, Horace the pigeon, although I don't mean no, a little bit worried about him. He hasn't turned up recently. He can be a little bit of a handful. He, I think he does it just to wind me up. Outside my window, on the windowsill, looking at me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Horace, how you doing, mate? You're right. I'm making a recording. Can you come back in twenty minutes? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Like, I said, okay. That's an interesting story. He's like suddenly he's telling me about uh, a shoe that he finds that he found on the beach. Like, what? Why are you choosing to tell me this story now, Horace? Yeah, I know it's an interesting story, and I realise you're excited, but can you tell me about it later? Uh-oh. Yeah, I can, I can come and get the, you want me to actually go to the beach and get the, the, the shoe and bring it back so you can play with it in the garden? Okay, we well, can you wait until I finish the recording? <laughs> oh, you can you you, don't, you can do that one. No, I can't. Oh, you can speak now. Okay. So yeah, that can be a little bit, a little bit um, off put in, but it's fine. It's fine. So, how does that feel? I want to do just just do a test for me. Just do a test. And this, this might seem like the most ridiculous thing to do, but just, just bear with me. I'm not going to ask you to dance around, um, rubbing, <laughs> I don't know, honey into your toes or anything. I just, 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 I want you to focus for a second. I want you to think about someone that you care about. Now this doesn't have to be someone that's alive. But at the same time, I don't want you to think about someone and have all a lot of different emotions come in that's, you know, it's, it's not about that. Um, it's not about bereavement. This is, this is about getting, you know, getting in touch with that feeling of, uh, compassion. So someone that you care about. Ideally alive, ideally, whether they're well or not, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but you know, as far as your feelings regarding that person, someone that you really care about, you might love them, you might just really, really like the person. Uh, you might have a lot of respect for them, uh, might be someone that you look forward to seeing. 
might be someone that you're about you're going to see today even it might be someone that's sitting next to you in a chair right now it could be someone that's in the kitchen cooking you some food and you know in 20 minutes time you might be eating that food and pretending it tastes nice because you love them so much <laughs> i'm joking um So I want you to think about it, get in touch with how does that feel, um, focusing that, we can call it love, we can call it compassion, um, it's, I'm not really sure what the difference is between love and compassion, in a sense, I mean compassionate, it gets used more often in a sense of um, when someone else is suffering, being compassionate towards someone else that maybe is suffering. But then we're all suffering in a way. You know, if you, if you treat every human being like they're suffering, then you're treating them properly because we're all suffering without... Um, being extreme we're all going through stuff we've all got issues we've all got you know we all know someone that's not very well maybe we're not very well millions of people out there that are not very well that are struggling with day-to-day -day stuff physically mentally um or they're worried about something you know so everybody has got their own stuff going on just being alive in today's society, there's a lot of stress involved in that, which is why I make these recordings so you can let go of some of that and get more and get back in touch, more in touch with feeling karma in your mind and in your body. It's kind of why I do this. So, you focus that lens, your lens, your mind, your focus of compassion on that person. And I'm guessing it, it kind of opens up fairly naturally. You know, if you care about someone, you care about them. Yeah, I realize if it's your partner or your child or your parent, you know, the... The level of um, caring and compassion can vary depending upon the situation you're in at the moment. You know, if you've had an argument with them, you might. Um, we we have a tendency of reverting back to being a little toddler. You know, have an argument with someone. I hate you. I hate them because you had an argument with them, but you don't really hate them. You you do in the moment. But you, it's more that you hate what they said and what they did rather than the person themselves. And, you know, then we become adults again a few hours later, maybe. So if you flip that around, that lens of compassion and focusing it on yourself, focus it on yourself. What does that feel like? Is it hard? Is it easy? Is it, is it even possible? I mean, do you feel that it's not possible? Do you feel that it's very simple? I realize you can't actually answer me when I ask these questions. The fact is, if you can feel compassionate towards another person, then it means you can feel compassion. It's that simple, which means even if it takes a little bit longer uh, or you have to open up and just wait for it to happen, it will towards yourself, feeling compassionate, feeling kindness, feeling love. And when 
you've got someone that you know cares about you, it can be relaxing, can't it? It can take the stress out of the situation. And it's it's a little bit like, um, you know, when you've got a little baby or a little, little toddler, they fall over and they're like crying because they hurt their knee. And what do we do? You look at the knee to make sure the knee's okay first, obviously. You know, if it was broken, then you take the child to the hospital and try and get a new child or something. But if it's just, if it's okay, sometimes all you need to do is kiss the knee. It's all better now. And the child smiles and maybe starts laughing and runs off. So this, in a way, is us kissing our own knee, which is a very strange sentence. I wish I'd thought about that before I said it out loud. Kissing my own knee? (laughs) It's getting that sense of comfort. The sense of safety that you would have in that situation of having your knee kissed. Now, not everybody's had that situation and not everybody has had that situation and can remember it. Not everybody's done that to a child. I think I have a few times, but not everybody's had children. Not everybody's uh, done that. So, But I think most people have probably seen it happen seeing someone do that to a small child and you see the face of the child go from being almost like it's the end of the world to laughing to pleasure because that kiss on the knee from the person that they love is almost the most important thing in the world to them in that moment In fact, it is the most important thing in that moment. Unless they're holding an ice cream, (laughs) then probably the ice cream is the most important thing in the world. But you, you know what I mean. Nothing's more important to a small child than an ice cream. (laughs) I don't know how true that is. I'm just, I'm just trying to remember how it was for me. Nothing was more important. Well, it still isn't, even as an adult. I've got an ice cream in my hand. Don't bother asking me anything because all I'm focused on is that ice cream. So how does it feel when you focus that compassion towards yourself? How does it feel? How do you feel physically? I mean, how do you feel physically now anyway? So 30 minutes, 32 minutes in, listening to me going on and on and on and on. How do you feel different? So you're going to feel different. The thing is, you don't, what we don't realize is we do feel different. If we felt all the same all the time, well, we don't. It's not possible. It's not physically possible to do that because we have different sensations. And sometimes if you're just sitting in a chair, doing nothing else uh, and focusing on your physical condition, first of all, it's probably not, you're not going to have a lot of fun, but there are going to be times that you drift off and your mind takes you Let's just call it daydreaming, really. And you start thinking about other things. And when you're thinking about those other things and you're imagining uh, different scenarios or remembering things from the past, or maybe literally falling asleep without realizing it, you're not experiencing those physical discomforts that you were before. You're just not aware of it. You're not aware of how you physically feel in that moment. 
which means you're not aware of how you emotionally feel. You're just not aware of anything really other than what you're thinking about. And you're in that moment, which is somewhere else. And you're feeling physically and emotionally however you feel in that daydream, I guess. So unless you're lying there or sitting down daydreaming about sitting in a chair with chronic pain, then which would be awful to, you know, to have daydreams like that. So you're going to be doing something different. You might daydream of sitting or standing in a lake or a river safely and the cool water just running through your body completely just your whole body feels completely relaxed and healing as that occurs as that gentle cold water runs against your body feels like it's running through your body through your legs your stomach your groin your feet your chest shoulders your arms your back it just feels it's running right through you cleansing every part of your body Just, you know, in the same way, oh, I remember years and years and years ago. It's, uh, it's quite a while ago, about 2003. It was just after Christmas. It might have been 2004, January. And we had a work do. I worked in a shop at the time and it was very busy all through Christmas. So just before Christmas. And we went to this uh, aqua spring thing, you know, where you could go and there was swimming pools and saunas and hot tubs and all kinds of stuff. So we went there as a group. Now, I was, it was weird because we were sitting in this, it was like a jacuzzi, a big big jacuzzi and we're all in there and this lady gets in and sits next to me and starts talking to us so we were all in our un not underwear but like bikini I wasn't wearing a bikini <laughs> on that particular day you know um, swimwear so she had a bikini on so she's sitting down The rest of my friends say, right, let's go, let's go into the sauna. I wasn't able to get up at that point. And I had to sit there for about five or six minutes. And it was just, I just remember that. It was very weird. And she must, she looked at me like, why are you still sitting there? All your friends have got up and you just sat next, you're still sitting next to me. Even though she sat next to me. Anyway, I remember at one point there was this, they had this like waterfall. It's not a real waterfall because, well, it's indoors. But they'd, it was really good and it was all these rocks and the waterfall came down and I stood underneath the waterfall and having that water and it was, it was like huge pressure, but it was definitely the right pressure hitting the top of my head. It was blissful. And at the time, at the time, the the reason I was working in that shop is because I'd left my full-time job due to having um, extreme anxiety for, a lot, for the last year. And I had to leave this full-time job and I just got that part-time job just to keep me going for a while so I needed that stress relief 
I really needed uh, to just let go. And having that waterfall, water, war just falling on my head, top of my shoulders, I guess it was hitting my back as well, but and my face, but the top of my head, my scalp. It was one of the best feelings I've ever had. Not good enough to go back and revisit and do it again. Too lazy for that, but it was an amazing feeling. Really, really, really amazing. And sometimes I get like a little, a little pinch of it, a little tiny little, you know, when there's a, a high powered shower, if I'm on a hotel or visiting someone or, and that could be like, oh, yeah, this is nice. But the waterfall was, it was like gallons of water just falling on me continuously. Oh. It was perfect. I wonder how you'd feel if you was in that situation. Just to have that. It was almost like it was letting my brain free. There was, like it was impossible to have any other physical sensations or focus on any other physical parts of my body when you've got a waterfall landing on top of your head. That's the only thing, it's the obvious thing to focus on, but it seemed like it was the only thing that I was going to focus on. But then it was the only thing that I wanted to focus on because it felt so good. Really felt good. So the physical release helped me with the emotional release, which in turn relaxed me more physically, which in turn relaxed me more emotionally it's that it is it's so connected the body and the mind hard to believe that in the past that they were classed as different things i mean they are different things but the idea that they're completely separate is is ridiculous because they affect each other you'd have to well we all know that our physical experience is affected by our thoughts. We all know that. Now, sometimes we may be not aware of how much our thoughts affect our, our physical experience. But during things like grief and extreme tension, you know, those kinds of stuff where you can emotionally feel it, in your body and you can feel the effects because it's too strong not to but we're also affected by the subtle thinking the things we think about most have the biggest effect on us and the good thing about it is we do have control over that so if you decide to focus on positive things decide to focus on what you do want not what you don't have start to focus on how you want to feel not how you've been feeling focusing on what you're going to do in the future instead of the horrible things that have happened in the past and when I say the horrible things We've all had horrible things happen in the past. We've also had lots of wonderful things that maybe sometimes we can't get in touch with. We've all had nice things happen. You know, it's... That thinking of like, no, nothing, nothing happens, nothing nice has ever happened ever. 
that's depression. That's a depression thinking. That's not true. It's not real. Everything happens to me. It's not true. I had a friend and he had that mentality where he actually lost a cousin. So his, co his cousin passed away, came to work anyway. And he said that he was close to her and I was, I got on really well with him. And he said, why me? But it wasn't him. It was her. She's the one that suffered. She's the one that passed away. It wasn't him. That mentality of why me? And he literally, he, he had to leave work because he had a breakdown. And, but he had that mentality even when he was in a good mood. Everything bad happens to me. Eh, why me? And what he didn't see is, because he was successful, he was one of the top sellers in the, in the company, if not the top seller. He was popular. So he had a lot going for him. But he didn't see him able to break out of that self-pity long enough to see the positives. Plus, he was ill. He was unwell, mentally unwell. So that's it probably is a bit unfair to... I'm kind of simplifying it. But his mental well-being would have improved had he been able to... Well, hopefully it would have improved had he been able to get more in touch with reality of the fact that things were going quite well for him. He had a, he had a little child who he loved. You know, it's, it's a lot of things that are going well. Some things weren't going so well, but just remember that. Why me? What do you mean you? It's not, it's, you know, it's like watching the news and then putting your hands on your head. Why me? When something's happened in another part of the world, it's not, it's, it's as ridiculous as that. If it's not actually happened to you personally, it's not you, is it? If it's happened to someone else. What is it always happened to? No, nothing, always anything. Uh. And some people won't understand that. Some people won't. Oh, we talking about oh, it's a bad luck. Mm. No, you don't. Um, and also, our environment has so much to do with what goes on. If you hang around with people that are negative and. Uh, not in good spaces themselves, and that's the only people you see, it's going to be hard to feel optimistic about anything. You might still be able to do it, but I noticed that when I was a counsellor, I was seeing nothing but depressed people, sometimes six times a day, six hours a day, and I'd come home, and I didn't feel very well myself because of it it was affecting me now I was professional when I was doing it and you know I, I left my own feelings outside the door but I did wonder I started to wonder how people do that how they do it for years and years and years and you know decades and still be around, still be able to do it. But then self-care comes into it, you know, uh, supervision, talking to people, talking to others, other counsellors. So, you know, there's, there's certain things that are done and you need to be kind to yourself. You need to be gentle with yourself. So I kind of carried that over, I suppose. And I don't practice as a counsellor anymore. I still have my little counselling moments, but I don't, um, people tend to come to me 
because I'm a good listener, apparently, and they're, you know, but I don't know how, how much use I am, to be fair, but I don't do it. I don't, I'm not a counsellor, a professional counsellor anymore, and probably never will be, partly because there's a lot, there's a few reasons, but, you know, it's just like being a therapist or doing hypnosis one-on-one. -on -one. What's the point in seeing six people a day if I can, if I can affect positively thousands of people a day by making podcasts? That seems to be the more logical thing to do. To me. just thinking about that waterfall oh I mean there's a, there's a lot of nerve endings in our head isn't there in our scalp and you think the brain is not far from the scalp you know there's a bit of liquid and then there's the brain I mean it's not that's why when people you know talk about uh, headaches and stuff now, I didn't know that the brains had no pain receptors. Once you get through the scalp, no pain in the brain. There's no pain in the brain. Yet pain produces brain, uh, the brain produces the pain, yet there's no pain in the brain. Now that's a weird concept to get my head around. The brain produces the pain. So you cut your little, you cut your finger gently. You know, I don't say, I'm not saying do that. I'm saying, so if someone cuts their finger, like when you're a kid, it's the finger that's causing the pain, obviously, because that's the bit that's bleeding and that's the bit that's just being cut. So that's, that's what's causing the pain. And then you have some education. I think it was, it wasn't till I was an adult that I, that I found this out. The brain causes the pain. So the cut occurs, the signal of the damage to the tissue goes up, your, goes into your spinal cord from your finger, moves all the way up your nerves into your spinal cord and whatever entry level there is, whatever it is, and then goes all the way up to your brain. And then your brain releases the chemicals which then produces the physical discomfort in your finger. And it happens so quickly. It is, it's not like a, a bus journey. It's a very quick, instant thing, even almost quicker than instant, which is impossible, is it? Obviously, it's instant. So I, I I accepted that. It's fair enough. Yeah, the brain causes the pain. But then to find out that there's no pain in the brain. There's no pain in the brain. So maybe the pain, the, the brain doesn't have to cause pain. If there's no pain in the brain, it clearly doesn't particularly like pain. Seems a little bit unfair, doesn't it? It's, it just shows that the brain can eradicate pain because the, the, the brain doesn't have any pain in itself and the brain controls everything and the brain controls the level of physical pleasure and discomfort or pleasure or discomfort whatever your brain controls that your brain allows you to have more pleasure your brain allows you to feel more relaxed in different parts of your body. And your pain has decided to not have any, your brain has decided not to have any pain in the brain. So literally, brain surgery, once you've broken through the skull, no nerve endings inside the brain. 
poke around, doesn't it? You can't feel anything. I obviously don't do this, you know, unless you're a brain surgeon. But isn't that fascinating? No pain in the brain. Which means the brain, and if you've got that in one part of your body, you can have it in another part. So, and as far as I'm concerned, the head is not, people say, oh, the head's not the body. It was connected. A little thing called a neck is connected. The brain is part of the body. Then you say, well, the, the hands are not part of the body. Yeah, they are. They're not part of the torso. If you're, if you only class the body as being your chest, your back, your stomach. Yeah. That's not just your body. Your body is everything. Your legs, your hands, as far as I'm concerned. And your brain, your ears, your eyes. And the anatomy of a body doesn't, it includes everything. Including your skin, your hairs, the molecules. So, if your brain has no pain... then it just shows you how powerful the brain is. It just shows you how by having trust in your brain you can start to make changes. Start to notice more comfort in your body more comfort in your mind and maybe your mind starts to slow down a bit sometimes you know it, I quite like it when my, my mind is racing around sometimes you know if I'm thinking about stuff or I'm reading a book or you know it's, it's or if I'm having a conversation sometimes it can be nice to have a a fast moving brain fast moving mind but then other times it's nice for it to just slow down relax and uh, the degree of peace that can come from that is I think it's quite nice the peace of just not having to do anything, just allowing yourself to let go. If you choose to. I talked the other day about overflow in a sink or a bath. And I like that idea that no matter how high tension or uh, stress levels can get, they'll always overflow in the same way with physical discomfort, it will always overflow. It will never go above a certain level. Once you have that overflow, you can lower it so that the level that it won't go beyond actually decreases. It decreases. Like from now on, it decreases, it doesn't, it can't go above a certain level. And you've chosen that level, which is more manageable for you. So I guess that might be useful, I don't know. I don't know. I had some weird dreams last night. I really did. I mean, some of the things that I talk about in these recordings will be memorable to you. Some things you might forget. Some things you might just take into your unconscious mind. And you know what I was thinking? A baby, if you want an example of an unconscious mind, what it is, and the suggestions and absorbing... A baby, a 
absorbs. You know, a baby, a toddler, like a, a small child who can't talk yet, basically. All they do is listen. They are absorbing into the unconscious mind everything that they experience. All the environments, all the things that people are talking about and doing, they're observing, and it's all going into their unconscious mind because that's how we learn how to act, how to be a human being. We learn by observing and absorbing all of that stuff. And sometimes it feels like we can spend the rest of our adult life trying to change that stuff, trying to uh, get rid of some of that stuff, some of that learned behavior, those learned attitudes, which aren't really us, because we didn't choose to learn it. We didn't choose to absorb that stuff. It was with us. So if you listen to a recording, a positive uh, audio, for example, or if you read a book, uh, you're choosing to read that book or listen to that audio. You you know that you're going to absorb some of that. But you're choosing. That's your choice. You had no choice when you was a baby and when you was a toddler, when you was a small child. So a lot of that stuff, a lot of it is really helpful and is maybe made you the person you are and you really perhaps should be feel great. Uh, grateful for it but there's a lot of stuff that isn't maybe as useful and perhaps needs to be removed the brain has no pain wow wow I just still find that phenomenal. It's, uh, there's a lot being studied about the brain at the moment. Neuroscience is probably the fastest growing science there is now. And they're discovering stuff which goes against what we already knew. If, you know, it's, there's there's a lot of corrections going to be having to be made soon. These old textbooks, which are only maybe 10 years old, will have to be revised. Which is, and it's interesting because some of the things that were, I guess, I guess, guessed, you know, they uh, from like hundreds of years ago have turned out to be completely true. For example, meditation, thousands of years old. Hypnosis, thousands of years old in different forms. Transforming the way you feel emotionally, transforms the way you feel physically. It has an effect on your brain changes your brain and all this is true they couldn't prove it they couldn't prove that the brain physically changes but it does if you was to spend the next six months focusing just on positive things reading positive books listening to positive audios, your brain will physically change because of that. It's amazing really, isn't it? So I'm going to go. Thank you for listening. This has been Let Me Bore Your Pain Away. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Be gentle with yourself. And as I said, notice how you feel now compared to how you felt before you decided to listen to my boring voice. Take care and I shall speak to you soon.
Lots of love.